Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be going back to our world of dragons to meet one of the most famous types of dragon and of mythological creatures to ever exist, sea serpents. Sea serpents are huge monsters that have been sighted by sailors and seafarers since ancient times, perhaps originated as representations of the primordial unknown dangers of the sea or interpretations of the creatures that these people saw while at sea. These creatures have a special place in human legends due to their prevalence in many mythologies, especially as adversaries to the gods themselves. So it is great to finally reach this point in our series. If you haven't watched the first video of this ongoing series, in which I introduced the first ancestors of dragons and the setting we will be working on, I recommend you see it to get better context on what we will be seeing today. Also, if you're enjoying this series so far, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi link available in the video's description. And, as always, I will be giving some design and biology notes at the end, so please stay if that is something that interests you. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Just as worms hold dominion as predators on land, their sister group in superorder Longititanes, the aptly named Mega Serpentes, or Sea Serpents, rule undisputedly in the seas and oceans of the world. Like their land cousins, Sea Serpents present a noticeable extension of their body length, their water environment allowing for much greater sizes and volumes that would be possible on land and their limbs have further receded into the body, to an even greater extent than those of worms. The adaptations of these huge reptiles to a sea environment are noticeable in today's research subject, one of the biggest sea serpents known to man, and one that halted the exploration of the northern parts of the world for a long time, until big enough vessels were developed to prevent being sunk by these creatures. In modern times, its scientific name is Titanoboreas Midgardi, based on its title of the Midgard Serpent, as given by the locals. The people near its habitat, the Norse, had a different name for it, one that referred to its vast size, Jormungandr. This dragon has a long, serpentine body, covered in a layer of fat that gives it a hydrodynamic shape, as well as protecting it from the cold ocean around it. Its overlapping, backwards-facing scales, similar to those of the worm, gives it a surface that reduces drag as it swims, allowing for faster movement in the water. In certain species, these same scales will form specialized structures used to veer and stabilize the dragon while moving, including analogs to pectoral and dorsal fins, the latter being quite noticeable in the German gander. In order to help them swim, the tail of sea serpents is vertically flattened, or like in shape, in some species even bifurcating to allow a greater surface for water displacement. However, the greatest adaptation of these predators is a web of blood vessels located near their head, which extract oxygen directly from the water, in a manner similar to other aquatic reptiles, such as sea snakes. This allows the sea serpents to breathe underwater to a limited extent, which, along with their slow metabolism, common to air-breathing marine creatures, means they can stay underwater for well over 8 hours at a time. Sea serpents are mostly found in saltwater environments, including estuaries, coral reefs, and even the depths of the seas, such as the Mediterranean Tiamat or the Japanese Tokoyo Dragon. 
Due to their oceanic habitat, a poorly explored environment even nowadays, it is likely the real diversity of this clade is still as unknown as the depths of the ocean itself, with even the species we know being very scarcely described at best. The most well-known species are found closer to the surface in warm equatorial waters, especially near the Mediterranean Sea, Middle East, and the Southern Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. That said, some species do inhabit northern colder waters, including the seas near Great Britain, China and Japan, and even the glacial seas near the planet's North Pole such as today's research subject. While there are many freshwater species of sea serpent, if you forgive the inaccurate naming, they are fewer and less abundant than their saltwater cousins. This is likely due to the presence of big predators that represent competition for the serpents, mainly crocodilians which have successfully occupied the niche of large aquatic predators in many environments. Wherever crocodilians are absent, other large predators, such as drakes and worms, have beaten serpents to the coveted niche. This is why freshwater serpents are more easily found in islands and colder places where neither of these creatures is present and many times have reduced their size dramatically compared to sea serpents. The diet of sea serpents is as varied as there is life in fresh and salt water. While most species are generalist predators and will feed on fish and sea life, and river or coastal species can feed on land animals that approach the water, some serpents are extreme specialists feeding exclusively on one prey, such as the Japanese ryujin, which feeds only on one species of jellyfish. Other serpents have gone the opposite way, adapting and expanding their diet until achieving omnivory, feeding on vegetables as well as meat, like the freshwater misuchi. Some of the biggest serpents such as the German gander, will even feed on whales, forcing them to become smaller and much faster in order to escape predation. However, despite keeping the whale populations in check, serpents are not a threat to the survival of modern species of whale. As is the case with bigger animals, the populations of these sea serpents are quite small, especially compared to those of whales and even one whale will be enough to feed a sea serpent for a long time, with their metabolism allowing them to go for a long time without eating after a meal. In order to catch prey, sea serpents have also developed a variety of strategies, the most common being countershading, a darker coloration on its upper side and a lighter color on its lower side, in order to blend in with their background whether they are being seen from above or below. Serpents that hunt closer to the seabed will also have stripes that allow them to hide among algae and even camouflage that helps them disappear among rocky terrain. The morphology of their bodies, heads and jaws is also very varied, depending on their specific diet and lifestyle. Some of the biggest species have evolved into filter feeders, developing an enormous mouth convergent with that of ancient species of whale. Serpents that feed on smaller creatures may have small heads and long, thin bodies that conceal their size in murkier waters, such as the Chinese Xialong. Or they may have longer, sharper jaws, like those of a crocodile, in order to hold on to slippery prey. Species that prey on bigger animals have wide jaws that allow them to rip chunks of their prey, and some specialized serpents will even develop shorter jaws to hold onto land prey and drown them in the water. The appearance of the German gander 
helps it in this purpose, as its counter shading and white ornaments will help it camouflage with the surrounding water and ice, and its long muzzle will help it hold its struggling prey underwater, as its capacity to breathe underwater will ensure it resists until its prey has died. As can be imagined, climate change and the reduction of the polar caps has severely affected the German gander, and a drastic reduction of its population has already been noticed by scientists, who believe this majestic animal could go extinct by the end of the century. That is, if storms don't kill them first. For, so far, unknown reasons, Many individuals of this species have been found dead and beached after particularly bad thunderstorms, likely becoming disoriented in the chaos. And that's it for a speculative biology look into sea serpents. Sea serpents have been requested a lot on the channel, both as a part of this series and as their own thing, so you can be sure we will be returning to these sea monsters sooner or later. Regarding our version of these creatures, the idea of giant, limbless dragons descended from our dragon ancestors was fun enough on its own, and for the design I decided to base it on modern whales and reconstructions of ancient marine giants, adjusting it to the morphology of the worms from our last video. Fortunately, the mythological side of it was pretty open to interpretation. At least from what I found on my research, there tends to be very little detail about the appearance and behavior of sea serpents, or at least of specific mythological and folkloric sea serpents, especially when compared to other types of dragons. This does make sense since these creatures live in an environment so different to that of humanity, that any sightings of sea serpents, whether within the context of fictional stories or real-life events, would be brief and allow for little time for careful examination of the creature. In the case of German Gander, and of many other serpents, I could really find no other description than Snake Big. However, the details on German Gander's family are what gave me the idea to use it as a research subject. For those who don't know, German Gander is the son of Loki, the shape-shifting trickster from Norse mythology, and two of his siblings are Fenrir, a giant wolf, and Hel, a half-living, half-dead humanish girl or woman. While there is, as mentioned, Little description of the serpent itself, I thought incorporating these relatives into the appearance of the Midgard serpent would be a fun idea. It was also fun to imagine how the presence of these big predators would create competition with other living beings, as well as shaping creatures around them, such as whales, which no longer had an advantage to size in the face of these predators. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And as always, if there's any other species of sea serpent you'd like to see in the show, please mention it in the comments below. I will gladly return to do a shorter episode to further deepen our understanding of the clade. So if you have any ideas for dragons that could show up in this series, or any creatures you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.